So everyone, welcome. We've got Jarrett in the land of Colombia. Spotty Wi-Fi. You should have. Have you followed that crypto punk, Spotty Wi-Fi? No. So he. <laughs> so you know, crypto punks as they took off, people were like, "I'm gonna make this my avatar." And so, um, if you look up Spotty Wi-Fi, that's his. That's his handle. That's his avatar. And he is a real life DJ that has DJed for Bored Apes. Has done a lot of crypto places, and he uses this crypto punk that's got like kind of like freckles right right here. Uh, he's a, you know, he's a punk of color and it's just, he goes by spotty Wi-Fi. So anytime I see someone's Wi-Fi go out, I think, Hey, spotty Wi-Fi, what's up? He's got a music video and everything. Like it's for real. <laughs> okay. I'll have to, I'll have to check it out. No, I didn't know that. I do love that when uh, crypto punks, I believe is this way. I know board apes is this way. Hello, Allison. How you doing? The fact that they give you the entire rights to be able to use the avatars, however you want. Is super cool. Well, there, this is in flux right now. So this week, okay. um, uh, Board Apes went to court over one of the people they're suing. There, there were a lot of, yeah, George, George says Spotty is awesome. Yeah, man, Spotty Wi-Fi, you know what it is. He's a cool guy, man. He really is cool and he's good for the space. He's a creative for the space. But um, uh, so the Board Apes is in court right now about this and it came out that they don't even have the right to give the rights to Board Apes. They have never How filed. Does that work? They've never filed any trademarks. They've never and and there's like the poor man's trademark, right? Like you do a cross state line sale, but with crypto, in this crypto world, we're always trying to obfuscate who purchased what from whom and why. And 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 when when we think that we're asserting ourselves because of the blockchain, it's immutable. It's immutable, it's but it's also hard, surprisingly hard to track from a rights perspective. Who actually has the rights to these board apes? Was it the generator that generated the apes? Was it the OG artist who came up with the look and feel? Is it the company? And this is where the fine line is. The company for the parent company for board apes, that's what's in question. Does the parent company for board apes have the right to enforce copyright led uh, rulings and ownership? Well, no. And so there's case law happening around this right now. Doodles, on the other hand, I just discovered, is explicit. Doodles, one, you have full commercial rights up to $100,000 worth of merge and, and use. So, like, I could, go, I could go find Doodles number 1,000, and I love that Doodle. And I could license them for my company, which is something that we have. Right now, we're going with, with the website company and Spark. We're looking at rebranding and re-imaging our entire world. And so we, we considered licensing a doodle because we love the look and feel for our clients. George says that case is going to set the tone for IP rights around NFTs also happening is a fashion case. I didn't know this with Hermes regarding digital wearables. Now, are we talking about IRL wearables appearing on physical, like so digital imagery appearing on physical goods, George? So George, are we talking about like digital things appearing on physical goods or you mean literally your avatar? wearing a Hermes watch uh, or something or, or outfit. That's interesting. This yeah, week is going to be digital. Big yeah, I think it's probably digital wearables. No, sorry to cut you off there because I, you know, as we go into the metaverse, whatever that looks like, it's going to be AR, VR, MR. It's going to be some mix of the three. Okay. Yeah. The rights around what you wear and who licensed them is going to be crazy. I was sitting with a guy in the airport the other day and he has a fashion line you know he has like some he's an influencer he has a fashion line so he put out some clothes and i was talking to him about you know nfts and fidgetal and what that would look like and he was like well that's kind of crazy because i was like yeah the thing about digital fashion that from like a business standpoint is that you're not worrying about sourcing the leather over here and then worrying about sourcing the beads over here and then you have to also think about csr and making sure you're doing it on the up and up you just create at one time and then there's marginal to zero you know uh cost to to replicate and so you could sell five thousand gucci handbags which will happen it's i think gucci's already started to do this um digital handbags but you know it maybe cost them such a small amount of price and it looks like george dropped a dropped a uh, a link in here and he says yeah digital purses etc exactly so we're talking about handbags on uh, trademark rights if they transfer to metaverse 
all in the conversation. And I think it's a really interesting one. I did not know that, however, about doodles, that it was only up to 100,000 because I think that's kind of weird, right? You and I buy a doodle. We go in, we create this really cool brand around it. We have our own podcast. We're like, oh, we have this doodle. It's amazing. And then we sell uh, $99,999 worth of merch. What do we yeah. just turn it off so we don't make the next sale? Like, I don't understand how that how works. Who's going to come after you? Yeah, yeah who's the government? Who, who are the police? <laughs> enforcement's going to be interesting. Now, that might happen in the form of a lawsuit. They might, and they, and remind you too, like, like in the example that my company is legit, was, was, hear me out, was legitimately considering licensing a doodle as our characterization for kind of the next season of our, it really reflects the target audience we're going after this. Think of like, think of doodles and think of how this animation is happening right now. And then think of that young 18 to 24 year old, you know, gaming native who's now getting into small business. And thinking, well, we could add these characters not to replace the IRL employees, but these characters um, participating and kind of interacting in an augmented reality sort of brand feel where in some of our media or some of our emails going out, you've got these personified kind of doodle looking characters. And then other of the media, like the videos, it's me, you know, so we're, we're looking at creating this fusion brand uh, going forward. And so as we can consider that, I might write a check to this person or wire them or sell them, you know, a hundred grand to license this for the next two years and I can do what I want with it. So like, can, am I limited to, to maybe selling a mug with this on it or are they limited from me? And then you're right. How do they track this? How would they even file a lawsuit when the smart contract doesn't even exist yet? Because banking and swift banking isn't tied into the smart contract system yet. So it is interesting, but I did think it w there was foresight here in Doodle's case. I do think, I do think they're, they are futurists as a company. They've done a real good job of putting a team together because they came out and said, listen, because of what we're doing with the Doodle brand, Doodles 2 and on will have zero commercial rights. So the fact that Doodles 1 this is, I think, going to drive the price of Doodles One up because think sure. as they as they build this brand that's piggybacking on Rick and Morty and that purchase, and then they're going to start rolling out their own um, IP with Doodles too. Have you seen like the the space Doodle generator and all this stuff? Yeah, I was actually as you were talking there a little bit. I opened up OpenSea because I wanted to know what the floor and the floor right now for Doodle is six seven five e six point seven five e. And ETH's price is, I don't know, 1500 1400 1300 yeah, yeah. I'm not even 1600 whatever. So you're yeah. looking at around, and once again, this is bad napkin math. You're looking at around $10,000 to get yeah. in on a project that I think, I just think it's going to be like owning a Simpson character in 15 years. You know, having yeah. like rights yeah. or having the power to do that. When they brought in Pharrell, I believe, as one of their creative directors or creative yeah. advisors, I was like, they know exactly what they're doing. Pharrell Williams. If you were into music when he's way back in the day with NERD, that's one of my favorite albums of all time. I just think he has a timeless approach to culture. And if you're building for the future, you need that. So yeah. I'm just so bullish on Doodles. It's, it's absolutely insane. It's something I actually hope, Doodles, if you're listening, uh, I would love to do a collaboration with you and Mercy Corps. We're looking to collaborate with NFT communities and Doodles is a blue chip for me. So that's yeah. a no brainer. I'm going to shout out Tristan's a comment here because I've done many podcasts on this on more than blockchain. It says metaverse concerts are starting as well, changing the entertainment world. Travis Scott just did one for 18 million. So normally- Is this a more recent industry, one? Yeah, it's a more recent one. Uh, and, I, and I wasn't aware that it was 18 million, but um, normally in the music industry, and I wish I had, I've had a couple guests on more than blockchain that are in the music industry and they could come on and talk about this. But a lot of it comes down to concert sales, merch, streaming sales, uh, you know, YouTube ads, um, but gone are the days of actually making money from the music, right? They don't actually make money on the music. The music is just like the medium to which they get to other things through merch, uh, through private events, you know, like, Hey, I'm going to have Drake at my whatever. Here's 200,000 yeah. to Drake. Drake come through. He does a 30 minute set. Everyone's happy. Yeah. And if you can picture the future, you don't have to go out on the road anymore. You know, you yeah. could still do that, but yeah. you could make that your higher ticket. Like if I go to MSG, it's going to be $2,000 a ticket because normally I'm just doing all metaverse concerts. So yeah. I was actually thinking, and, and I, I guess we'll share it now, but 
in the future, the IRL is going to be so freaking sacred. It already is kind of now. And I mean, yeah. we're the best example. I think, well, I think it'll I, go to premium. Yeah. It, yeah, because you will go to premium because you and I have never met. And also, we should have said this at the, at the top of the hour here, but um, Jay is not with us today. He has had yeah. a very big event at work and he needs to be all hands on deck. So he he's is pumping. Not, yeah, he's pumping. They're, they're doing some big revenue moves right now. So he's not here. Um, but, you know, the three of us have never met. But the IRL, mm -hmm. when we're together, that could be like a big moment. So I do think the IRL would be premium for any content creators, for any influencers. Yeah. And I think the future of the world, and once again, I'll write a medium on this probably, but it's like going to be like Comic-Con where yeah. you're going to go and see people and be like, oh yeah. my God, I saw them in real life, even though you see them yeah. every day on Twitch or on mm -hmm. YouTube or whatever. And so I just think it's going to allow creators to be able to leverage their brand literally through the moon and it'd be something that like we don't, yeah. we don't currently see, you know? A very small parallel to this is um, I, right now we have an influx of leads in one of our companies. And, um, I always get these referrals because I built all the relationships and we're seeing a lot of the old heads say, Hey, I got to meet in person and all the new heads, all of our new clients, the ones that would align with doodles, they don't even think about it. They, they literally don't even think about an in-person meet. It's not even like, oh, that's even an option. Like, I mean, and, and then they think they, they have, they're less, they're less awkward on zoom or virtual than they would be in person. They're like I, they start thinking about, do I even have the clothes to meet with someone? Where would I, where are we meeting up? I got to find a car. Like, what are you talking about? But the old heads are like, I can't tell you what to edit on my website without meeting. So I've had several leads and this is where you're talking about. The IRL has a premium. So, uh, I, this happened twice in the last 12 hours. I want to make some edits to my website was one. And I said, okay, they said, but we have to meet in person. This is an older client, uh, a, a client that I've had for a while, right? And I said, we've got to put childcare together for our team, vehicles and schedules. And we don't even work on same schedules with our team. And so they're like, uh, I'm sorry, but like, I don't even know how to think about, literally, I don't even know how to think about my website unless we're together. And it's like, okay. There's something going on. And then right after that, I got a phone call that says, hey, I've got a referral. I said, when are you available? Well, I'm only available after 6 p.m. I said, I only work business hours. They said, you can't make it. You can't make an exception. I said, I'm, I literally, I can meet you in person, but here's the date. And it was like way in the future. They're like, you don't have anything sooner. I said, I have plenty sooner. I have plenty virtual. I can meet you by Zoom. I can meet you. I can meet you plenty earlier, but. If you want to meet in person, and so both of these people, I had to schedule out over a week out, and they were flabbergasted. Like, mm -hmm. and, and we had this conversation that there's a premium on IRL, and it's sacred, and it's almost like, it's almost like the fact that I live in a small town, is it, it's, it's almost like I'm protecting that, because I go out here and people don't know that we do this. When, you know, we've got a big follow. Look at the numbers. We've got a great following. You're in Bogota. We could be anywhere. And there, there is a massive premium on this. Now, a quick thought I had back on um, the case that George brought up with the Meta Birkin. You mentioned augmented reality and the IP, the intellectual property uh, rights in um, digital, in the metaverse itself makes a little bit of sense. But when you start thinking that we are going to be living in a true augmented reality, I could look at you and when graphic cards are good enough, you're wearing a black shirt now, but it could simply, man, you just purchased this awesome Gucci shirt. We can fake backgrounds. Why not fake your shirt real time with a slight delay? So you bought this awesome Gucci shirt. You just want to represent or a piece of jewelry in that augmented reality. And someone takes the time to craft it so it glints right, so that it moves right with your actual movements. It only makes sense that we're going to value this at a premium. Uh, you want to go to Tristan's comment real quick? Yeah, for sure. I actually, I, I, I mean, I'm glad that we got to this because I think it's really important. And I think you talking about a business owner and saying, hey, I can meet up with you, but it's going to take a week. Even in like pre-internet, this is where we live days. I really feel like that's pretty generous. I mean, if you're a, bus a busy business owner being booked two weeks out, like I don't think it's crazy. And I've also built websites for years. And more recently, I've had a client who only wants to meet up to edit. And, and I'm telling them, dude, I'm like, dude, that's, that's not going to happen. I'm, I'm not going to do that, you know? And not because for this I price. Saw, 
yeah, not for this price. And I also said, here's the thing, like what we're going to do, I could just do it over uh, Zoom. I could record it and then I can send you that. So you have what we talked about. Or we're going to go sit next to each other and we're both going to play on the same keyboard. I would like you to be able to drive a little bit in this relationship. Um, and so I've had some of the similar things, especially with like editing websites, because people literally want to take their finger and they want to put it on a screen, which is mm -hmm. no different than them putting a mouse on the screen. That's right. Um, and <laughs> so it's a very interesting thing. But yeah, let's, I want to shout out Tristan. And Tristan, I actually just dropped you because I couldn't figure out how to get on the live. Uh, an episode of More Than Blockchain where I talk about how the metaverse is going to change things. And I've been saying for years um, that there's just going to be, you know, I, I watch the NBA and NBA courtside tickets can be like $5,000. So what a yeah. company's going to go do is they're going to go buy three seats and they're going to take that and they're going to put a bunch of cameras in it and they're going to buy it for the entire season. And yep. they're going to do this at every single arena and they're going to put very high def cameras in there. Uh, cameras that are going to be able to basically simulate guess the metaverse where basically you're gonna be able to put on goggles yeah and you're going to be able to look around and see the game as it happens in real time as though you were sitting there now you're not gonna be able to get up and walk and get popcorn you're not gonna be able to go to the bathroom sure. but imagine the revenue from that mm. normally a company or 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 the the arena could only sell those three tickets say they're they're five thousand dollars each that's fifteen thousand per game uh, if someone wants to do the math multiplying that by 82 games in the season for the nba go ahead but once you do that, you could just sell a subscription for $200 a year to be able to watch any NBA game like that. Yeah. And eventually you're going to break a point where you're just like raking in the cash. Yeah. Um, so I say that because Tristan says uh, there's a startup that's co-owned between the U.S. and Turkey that's bringing the sports world into it uh, where you can open a door in your home and be pit side to the soccer games worldwide for a subscription based model. And that's exactly what I'm talking about. And I spoke about it. I think it's episode 15 oh, wow. of blockchain where it's just totally that. You're going to be able to put on a headgear, uh, whether it's augmented reality, virtual reality, or some type of mixed reality, and then be able to feel like you're in the stadium. Uh, and you'll yeah. pay a subscription for this, but you're going to be able to kind of feel like you're among the fans, you know, like seeing what's going on in the crowd. And yeah. as a sports fan, that's really cool. And I think the same will happen with Broadway. The same will happen with anything right now where people are sitting in a seat, which is absolutely yeah. fascinating. From a revenue perspective, it's, it's just mind-boggling. Um, let's like give a shout out there, Grant. Yeah, Billy, good morning. Or Billy says, good morning, Billy Weigel. Billy himself is a financial investor. Billy, we're doing Friday Finances, hint, hint. We might talk about that later, but check that out on Fridays. And you would be a great participant in that. Um, but uh, Aussie says, definitely interesting. And I'm going to go back to George's comment in a second here. But Ready Player One was a phenomenal book. And it really envisioned, as so many of these science fiction books did, this world. And if you think about, opening a door and being courtside or pitch side, but then thinking about, wait, I value that. I value being able to sit courtside at a game. And then you think they're going to put that same price tag on there. And what if you can only afford nosebleed seats? They're, they're, they can control this with a single dial. And what made me think of this was this new Travis Scott concert. If we all recall, Travis Scott did a concert and Fortnite and it made a killing and broke a lot of ground. And then he just did this new concert. And then I, that got me thinking about Snoop Dogg, how he makes appearances in Decentraland or, or Sandbox, wherever he's at, where he has concerts and after concert parties and stuff. But think about it. I, ask, I just asked myself this question. How do I know that's really Travis Scott? How do I know that's really Snoop Dogg? We already have Tupac Shakur appearing as a hologram, right? And so the question is, is when you said there's a premium on IRL, Think about the new level of pure, and I, and I would agree with, justification for Snoop to say, I'll let you license my Decentraland figure, put a suit on someone else, play my song. We all know that the songs are either choreographed or synchronized or, or, or lip synced anyway, or I'll even be in my booth and I'll actually commit to singing for this premium. You just pay a little bit extra. I'll show up on time for that. But I've built a brand, and this is what Snoop knows. I've built a brand. This is what Travis Scott has done. This is what Travis Scott, Snoop, Bored Apes, and now Doodles, they're all in the same business. We have built a brand that you said you value. It doesn't matter if I'm there or not unless you want to pay a premium because my time is worth something. It's worth something to me, and you said you're willing to pay. And so I think that we are going to have a, a whole new existential crisis here uh, pretty soon. And then I'll get to Billy's comment, but real quick, George did also mention 
think gaming assets. Now we knew this from a conceptual standpoint, right? Like, oh, it'd be still cool to have this cool Willy Wonka outfit or this laser cannon, right? But I think this stuff is going to have actual in-game impacts cross gaming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you're okay with I'm just that giggling it's like it's like before the show i gave you a challenge to say laser cannon and then you somehow worked it into the show that's how ridiculous that was i didn't i did he didn't do that by the way but we should start that we should start um, doing that exactly when i'm like pumpkin patch anyway uh so my favorite yeah. was when i used to preach i had my youth pastor give me the term aluminum siding and i had to work it into a sermon aluminum siding and i was like you know when you're close to the lord it's like having aluminum siding repelling the enemy. You're welcome for that. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> um, it looks like Billy, Billy Weigel is going to take us in a different direction, which I, I think we should yes. go towards. But Let's before we go there, I, I, on more than blockchain, I've talked about the metaverse a lot. And I just think it's kind of a fascinating, it's all hypothetical at this point. I mean, like yeah. what's, what exists now is like golden eye on N64 compared to video games yes. today. It's just all very new and very kind of raw and not, not as refined as I think a lot of us are used to kind of engaging with and yeah. quality on the internet and UI and UX. So um, one of the things I wanted to say yeah. about this and did it just slip my mind? That's all right. Is... We could always just talk about Bitcoin. Yeah. You know what? I forgot. It had to do something with the metaverse. I'll come back to it and I'll bring it up in an in, in opportune you. time. Um, but why don't you talk about Billy's comment here? Cause I think it takes us back to what we wanted to talk about today, which is the market. And is it going to go up or is it going to go down? Yeah, so Billy Post, if you're listening to this later, Billy Post, talk to me uh, about everyone saying BTC will pump to 25K, then back down. Further, the better. I have $5,000 in Binance ready to go. Please watch Binance closely. If you have not been paying attention, not financial advice, but um, it, it, uh, they have walked a very thin line. CZ has walked a very thin line. Binance US is obviously different than Binance. We hope, fingers crossed, but um, please find uh, an account. You are very confident that your money is safe in. Um, further, the better. I have $5,000 in Binance ready to go once it's close to 12,000. Now, 12,000 was close to your number, Jared. Am I correct? Yeah, my number was always the lowest, which would be like super low with the standard deviations or whatever was 8,000. And my upper limit for the bullish case was 12,000. So I do still believe, and now we can get right into this, that it will go down to 15, 16, 17. I just think the macro environment's horrible. I think there's so many layoffs. Uh, I just think, I mean, the fact that eggs are now like increasing, there's just still so many global supply chain issues. I think that this pump that we're kind of having right now is kind of like a head fake. And, but we'll, you know what, we'll see. We'll see. I, the, 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 the key the key is <laughs> Jay, Jay is Jay is over there. Listen, I'm not going to give well, away. Is that really Jay? I'm not giving away. I hope it is. I'm not going to give away what Jay is up to other than taking some five or six million dollar thing to eight or ten million right now. He's over there and he has found time to comment. 25K is a good bet. <laughs> I looked at that because all of a sudden it pops up and says, not crypto bros. I'm like, wait, we're not crypto bros. And Jay's over there squirreling away, listening <laughs> to us, giggling. Um, Keep going. <laughs> um, well, now I forgot what I was going to say, but I think, oh man, I want to go back. He says really 25K is a good bet. You were calling for 12K because the price of eggs was going nuts. Um, are they that coupled? Jay would say they are that coupled. Are you believing that TradFi DeFi is so coupled that if, if DeFi got into a real strong pump, where people were like, yeah, F fiat, and they were just throwing liquidity again. Rao Paul said very clearly that what drives this market is liquidity and, and consumer confidence. And in the TradFi, it's like just consumer confidence. Like, sure. will they decouple in runs or are they coupled for life? I think right now they're coupled. And I think you could probably show a chart over a week or a month where they're not. But like over the long haul, the S&P, you know, as Bitcoin goes, the S&P, like, the, let's just say this bitcoin doesn't really pump without the smp making positive moves you know a lot mm. of the stock market is up 30 to 40 percent since the beginning of the year same with bitcoin and crypto uh it's up pretty good amount since january 1st um so they're still really coupled in my mind and it all has to do like Raul said with liquidity and the fact that right now the cost of capital it's so much to go ahead and borrow that people aren't doing it um and there's you know there's unemployment is on the rise and 
I think, and I've said this many times before, but I'll say it again, that I do think the unemployment metrics in the United States specifically are really flawed because it doesn't take into account the people that have just given up on looking for jobs. Um, yes. They're not taken into account. And there was an article that came out. Oof, I forget exactly the public, like the, you know, the publication, but it was basically saying there was an economist, I believe at MIT or Harvard, and I should not confuse the two, but I am, that basically mm-hmm. said he doesn't know where the 2 million people that should be part of the labor force are, um, mm-hmm. have kind of left since the pandemic. And so they're not being taken into account, at, uh, you know, in our unemployment statistics. So mm-hmm. I know that politicians will say unemployment is low, but if you ask the average person in the United States, they're not exactly thrilled about where their finances are. And I'm using the United States as a case that you and I are the most familiar with, but yeah. like the rest of the world is not much better because many of them are on currencies that are dying, uh, that, are, yeah. that are being devalued combined with local inflation at their supermarket. And I had actually posted something in a group chat of buddies of mine this morning that Bloomberg had put out and it was just a super catchy title. And it said, more Americans making over a hundred thousand a year, say they're living paycheck to paycheck. And it says some 64% of us consumers equivalent to 166 million people were living paycheck to paycheck at the end of 2022. That's an increase of three percentage points from a year earlier or 9.3 wow. million or 9.3 million Americans. And out of that group, some 8 million were people earning more than a hundred thousand dollars a year. Now, wow. I just wow. wanted to share that because I think that sometimes if you watch the news or you read anything and you're looking at the markets, I don't think that the markets are taking into account what's, what's happening on Main Street. Maybe not yeah. what's happening on Wall Street and for the wealthy mm-hmm. and the rich and those who can invest. Yeah. But I think Main Street is really, really hurting. Um, and the simple anecdote I threw out was like eggs, you know, eggs are expensive. Therefore, Bitcoin's going to go down. It's kind of a ridiculous thing. It may not be causality, but there's a correlation there that in order for like crypto to really go up, here we go, crypto to really go up, <laughs> it's either going to be institutions, as I think George yeah. is calling out, um, yeah. or it's going to be retail and retail is not going to do it right now. So George says, banks worldwide are moving to crypto. My mom always used to say, what does that have to do with the price of eggs in China? Well, mom, a lot. And <laughs> we live in a stupid globalized world where yeah. the butterfly flaps its wings and it will affect, create hurricanes on the other side of the world. So there's my diatribe. I think. You know, something that's bothering me of late is I'm <laughs> to continue with the theme of eggs for everyone, you know, chicken or the egg on this idea are is life really that hard on Main Street in America or are people trying to live up to the social media dream? Um, there is a strange sociological and I wish we could have the um the guys that wrote Freakonomics on the show to really school me on some of these analytics. But if you see these interviews on social media of people who are trying to find a high value man, I put that in air quotes for those listening later, uh, or a high value woman, and you ask them, hey, what does a 30 year old male or what does a 30 year old high value woman make? What, What partner are you looking for? How much do they earn a year? And they will throw out ridiculous numbers. Like you'll get everything from $300,000 a year to a million dollars a year. And there is a powerful Census Bureau um, app that I want. I meant to bring on the show. Maybe we'll do it for Friday Finances or maybe we'll just do a a one-off with this. There's an app that the Census Bureau put how likely you are to meet your dream mate based on the Census Bureau and uh, in in the United States for our international viewers. And the Census Bureau puts in all of its statistics and... It will say, how tall is the person? What's the person's gender? What do they do for a living? And how much do they earn? And someone put in, I want to, I want to find a six foot one male uh, who's not obese, who has a full-time employment or is self-employed and earns over $250,000 a year. And if you look at the numbers, it's less than 1% of the population. You have a 1% chance of ever meeting this mate. Go ahead. Sorry. Say that. Can you say the the criteria again to build up to that? In the one example I saw, it was yeah, in the six, one example. In this one example, it's a six foot one male. Uh, I think they were in their thirties, making two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year. Not obese, which is a major factor in the United States, right? Not obese and not already married, right? Or not already with somebody else. Um, it was less than one percent for that person. 
you know, we don't have enough time today to go no. to cryotherapy therapy on this, <laughs> okay. but I will never understand Well, I will yeah. understand like psychologically, like, uh, you know, um, evolutionarily, maybe why yeah. you'd want a bigger partner from like some fear thing. Oh, but, tall, like, like height. The stuff, amount yeah. of people yeah. that are so specific about the height of their yes. partner yes. is so weird to me. It's yeah. just so strange to me. It's and as weird as understand. some of these financial. Like, why do you think 250? Well, I, I can't. I'm living paycheck to paycheck at 100. Show me your invoices and bills. Show me the leases you have. Now, maybe, granted, I'm a single mother home. I've got two kids. I get it. But it, is that we hand these anecdotes around so much. Is that an accurate measure of anything? And my point is this. When we talk about recession and we talk about people barely getting by, and we talk about inflation, I wonder how much of some of the average person's estimate that uh, the government needs to do something, or I'm not earning enough, or I gotta go find a better job. I was making 120 at Spotify. I'm not gonna get by if I don't make 180 at Google. And it's like, oh my gosh, how are, how are you existing? What are you living? Well, I'm living in San Francisco and in a part, well, well, okay, time out, like, why? Why? Like, do you need to be making more? Or do you need to be consuming less? And, that, and I know that this is about crypto. We need to be talking about crypto so we can circle back. But I, I, I am convicted that these numbers are not, we cannot take these numbers at face value, I guess is what I'm saying. We need to dive yeah. dip, uh, deeper. We could always circle back uh, on that later. Yeah, well, we, why don't we touch that as we're getting close yeah, yeah. to the end of the show. And yeah. I actually remembered what I was going to say. And we actually have a couple Please. of amazing comments here. Yeah, we'll, we'll get, get to, to back to those comments when we come back. Um, one of the things that I was going to say yeah. was that um, I actually probably need to change the light because now I feel like I look like an Oompa Loompa with this beard blue I have here. <laughs> um, but uh, I remember what I was going to say. And it was about Snoop Dogg and his okay. brand and Doodles and Travis Scott and Bored mm -hmm. Ape We were talking about the power of brands. And I think that's really, really salient in Web3. Yeah. And you were like, how do I even know if it's Snoop? Because maybe Snoop sold the rights to use him on Tuesdays and Thursdays on some talk radio. Yeah. And I was watching Elon talk about how I think it's speech AI or talk AI. Yes. Or the AI is getting audio so dot AI. Audio dot AI. Thank you so much for correcting me. Audio dot AI. I and saw this. I'm going to be launching a more than blockchain episode coming up with a buddy of mine. And he talks about, you'll have to listen to the episodes. You can hear more. He's into AI. He's built his own AI products. It is, it is the space that like four or five years ago, he said, this is all I want to do is focus on this. And he's like totally shifting into that professionally, which is really fun. Oh, voice AI. Um, and he said, listen to this, Grant. You're, this is crazy. Anyone else listening? I want to know if you've heard someone else say that they have this already set up. He's the first person I've heard saying that they have this set up, which blew my mind. He and his wife, and I went to their wedding. And here's a, here's a, TL, here's a, here's like a, two, a TMI from that wedding. I don't even know if he wants this shared. But at his wedding, he created an AI. It's like vows.ai or something. So in front of everyone, his, uh, his partner, Lindsay, read out her vows, right? Oh, my God. And then he said, you know, I love you. I want to do this the right way. So in front of everyone, he put what he wanted his vows to be into the AI product he had created oh and gosh. then read out what the AI said for a vow. Okay. Okay. So this guy, he's amazing. Yeah. He's wonderful. He's going to be coming on. He'll be on more than blockchain soon. Make sure you follow along cool. for that. He said... He and his wife, and once again, if you have heard this, please hop in the comments, or if you're hearing this after, find me. He and his wife, they have devised a code among them. So that way, if his name's Andy, if he were to ever call his wife and say, hey, I need $10,000, uh, you know, I need you to wire it to me and I'm in a jam. She would say, okay, I can do that. Or, or you know, what's my social? I can tell you anything that would be fishy. They have a code. Because he's so highly aware of how fine-tuned AI is going to be. And yeah. I started to think, and on the podcast, I say this, I started to have like Interesting. a, wow, come to Satoshi moment here. Um, yeah. Where I basically <laughs> said, I know, I know you like that one, where yeah, I yeah. basically said, um, I guess I'm in trouble. And Grant, so are you. And so is Jay Harris. Our voice, there are hours of our voice on the internet hours. that an AI could suck up and just be me. You know? And you know where this exists that we use in a commercial way. You and I already use this in, what? in, in Descript. So Descript, for those watching, Descript, Descript yeah. is the video editor we use. It is a Y Combinator graduate. 
it is um, a video editor that Jarrett and I use, uh, NJ, when we post our episodes. But what happens is it, it reads for our transcription all of our voice, it takes all of our audio files, and I label who says what and why. And it has a huge big data database. That way, we could either overdub if there's a mess up, or I can type the word and it will take our samples from hundreds of episodes and, and, and synthesize it unnoticeably. It's, it's, it's insane. It's and surreal. The mark, it is surreal. And the idea then of someone like Snoop being able to license themselves and synthesize themselves, not only is it not there to fool us, I don't think it's there to fool us, not in that commercial sense and, and other ways maybe. But in a commercial sense, it, it will just accept the fact that, yeah, Snoop's a busy guy. Why wouldn't he license? If he can license his image for a cartoon on the Cartoon Network and they put Snoop in a cartoon on the Cartoon Network, would we care any less or any more if it was a concert in decentralized sandbox? Go ahead. We got some great I'm, comments. Yeah, we got some great comments. I'm not sure if you would because I know people today mm -hmm. that will pay large amounts of money to hear like Eagles cover band. Yeah. Eagles cover band. And it's yeah. really no different. I'm just actually listening to that music in real time. Yeah. You know, like if I really like an artist. So I'm, I, anyways, it's, it's, I don't it's, think we'll I, care. That's, yeah. I don't think we're here. And that's what I wanted to say, but I forgot about yeah. the metaverse, about the brand, about using AI. Uh, I think NFTs all get sucked into here as communities become tokenized and kind of blockchain. Uh, yeah. So we have a bunch and a bunch of comments here, and I really want to. <laughs> Real Steve quick. Uh, yeah, Steve ahead, no, Crypto ahead. says, I was worried about these robocalls. And then do you want to? <laughs> You want to talk about the yeah? Let's back up real quick. Game. George Pate yeah, says, "If you're having trouble getting eggs, just get them chickens and heat them with your miner." I absolutely believe this. Um, Jay was asking, as not crypto bros before, are a hundred thousand dollar earners living paycheck to paycheck because of debt? And this is kind of what I was getting at. Maybe we could unpack this uh, a little bit more. Maybe we should all look at the Census Bureau because this was U.S. data. We do need to look at other countries, um, but our our anecdotes were being pulled from U.S. Census and um. Maybe it was debt. Maybe they were claiming they had to live with debt to get by because of the price of inflation. But I present for most people's consideration based on George next, George's next comment that living in places like LA, New York, San Francisco, eat up more than 40% of income, big salaries in metro area kills any fancy living. I agree with this and I need to be more empathetic. I have always chosen to live in medium-sized to small cities. For this reason, we live in Central Florida right now because it is the most stable from an inflationary standpoint place in the country that we have found yet to live where we have a good standard of living. Not exactly our politics. No, we don't get mountains. Yes, we get surf. But so we're missing out on and there's we're missing out on some things and there's a value exchange here. But I would never choose to live here. So I say move somewhere else. But I need more empathy because a lot of these people that were born in these places say, I'm talking about my family, my best friends that I had since high school, the place where I know to do coffee. Grant, why don't you just pick up and leave? Well, because I'm a local here and I love my coffee shop where I literally know everyone from the mayor who sits to buy and coffee, literally to the real estate investor I meet. And I always check, hey, what's going on with real estate? And I mean, I, I'm a local and so are they. And so I, we can't just say, hey, ditch it. So that probably is, is a lot of what that has to do with that. Jay says, I'm a four out of five. Maybe the, maybe it's the criteria where <laughs> he's a 1% man. <laughs> is that Jay or who is that? I can't see who that, that was Jay commenting as, as, as us before he went and got his, his, his handle. Monica. Yes. If you have a show horse, <laughs> this was, uh, in, yeah, this, this was this in was response in to this. To, exactly. <laughs> how are they, how are, how are people making hundred K plus, you know, not, not okay. How are they getting by? Monica is a equestrian. Uh, she is always on her horse. I know her personally. And yes, it's a very, it's a very expensive way to live. And then let's come down to, uh, this comment here. Do you remember the Kevin Hart joke about the code he had with his friend where they would warn each other if their significant other was around? I remember the joke, but I don't remember the actual, the actual words they used. And then Steve-O Crypto, I feel like they're collecting my voice. I had two calls yesterday and two texts actually. Hey man, I'm sorry I left my dress there. This is Grant. I think you have the wrong number. And then it dawned on me. This is social engineering. They're, they just threw out a text. Oh, this must be the wrong number. Sorry. 
I am not even going to respond to wrong numbers or phone calls anymore because of this nope. very reason. I, I, with all the phishing scams that are out there right now, mm -hmm. I literally get texts all the time. Yeah. I get texts all the time. I don't have Amazon Prime. Very open about that. And I'll get a text probably once, once a month that says, we missed you. We'd love to swing back tomorrow. Yeah. Here's your uh, delivery ID number. Yeah. Um, we know it's electronic, so we can't leave it on the stoop, you know, or yeah. on the, on your front door. Let mm -hmm. us know when's a good time. And then it says, click here to, to sign a link. Yeah. Delete those texts. Do not click anything. That's right. I get email. I get probably five to 10 emails a day that, that don't even go to my spam that are just from like Best Buy that said, you know, you want a fridge, click here. And you look at the email and it's like 70. It looks like a, it looks like a Bitcoin. It looks like a crypto address at Gmail. <laughs> Um, yeah, obviously there's problems with it, but yeah, it's, it's really and, quite and, crazy. And Steve-O says exactly. And, and I gotta tell you this. So the website company we have, we encounter, we have hundreds of clients. We've got 245 websites that we're stewarding and it's all like local small business and expanding. All these are small business owners who have purchased domains, say for example, at GoDaddy, they don't get the domain privacy. So their email, if you just look up a who it's called a who is search. It's easy to look up who owns more than blockchain. If you didn't pay for the privacy, your um, it's called ICANN, which is a Patriot Act thing in America, where mm -hmm. so that if you ever, you know, shill some sort of Iranian money or some, you know, enemy of the state money, they have to know who you are. And they are required by law because they require the information. Your information is therefore public domain because it's public domain because it's the government. And then suddenly your information is out there unless you explicitly purchase privacy. So they get bombarded, all of them get bombarded with these emails, these phishing emails. And that email might do exactly what you're saying. This is an American mm -hmm. Express. Your, your bill is past due. We're going to cancel your account. Click here to update your information. Oh my God, of course, it's super convenient. I'll click the big blue button. Never. Actually in the from or sent information, hit the little drop down menu and whatever your email server is and look and see, is this the case? And still, even if, you're, even if you think you're sure, browse directly to American Express in this example, or browse directly to that client. Don't click anything in emails unless you absolutely know who it's coming from. Mm, absolutely. Um, you know, we should probably say this every single episode, just so if you come yeah. across us, you know that we're like cyber privacy is huge. I'm, yeah, Kevin I Rose constantly have my, have my VPNs on all the time. I mean, Who's like this? we talk, uh, Kevin, Kevin Rose is the founder of dig.com. He launched an NFT collection. You might know of proof X, Y, Z who own moon. Okay, yep, exactly. And he just got fished for all of his stuff. Oh yes. I and, saw this. Yep. Yep. And he's a technologist people. So what is phishing? Well, phishing is different than a hack folks. In fact, I dare say 98% of all NFT hacks and NFT scams where people's accounts get drained are phishing scams, meaning it was non-technical in nature, meaning they sent you an email or sent you a text or convinced you that you were doing a sale and got you to tell MetaMask to give them access. This is not a hack. This is not a hack. A hack is like a coding deal where they, where they trick you that way and, and actually code into your thing. They actually psyched you out, psych, and got you. And if they can get Kevin Roos, who invented dig.com, has millions built into his account and just click the wrong link, it can happen to you too. And you're right. Every time we get on the show, don't get fished. Don't click links and emails you're not familiar with ever, 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 ever. Yeah. Ever. And if you get an email from not crypto bros, it was not us. We don't do emails, right? You might get a weird WhatsApp. <laughs> we, you know, we don't, you're not going to yeah. get like a click here now to get your subscription to not crypto bros. <laughs> Like the one I see is it's a Google form and we sent you 0.1 BTC. You got to click here to claim it or you're going to lose it. And it's like, like some non-technical person's like, I better click, you know? <laughs> yeah. Well, it could, yeah. Cause those Google forms are where they ask you to put your seeds in, That's you know, right. they're just like, yeah, just send us over your seed and then we'll That's send right. you to Bitcoin or whatever. And it's just like, ugh. before we go any further about protecting your bottom line, did we answer 25 K to 15 K where, what's it going to hit first? I want to make sure we, we fulfill our promise. And, and actually, let's back up. Someone mentioned Zent Cash, and I think it was George Pate. George Pate mentioned ZTC. I looked it up, George. I'm looking this up. It is at an all-time low, my friend. It popped a little bit, but I'm wondering what it is. 
is it a gaming project? It looks like it might be a gaming project or an in-game currency. Uh, he says, ZTC, check it out. It's going gonna, it's gonna to moon, not financial advice. But do you think it's going to hit 15 first or 25K first? Oh, I think this is a super good question. I mean, it's so close to 25K. I could see it going to 25K first. I, I guess my, I, I'm still thinking it's going to go lower, but I don't know. Like, that's, that's, a, that's an assumption based on past historical data, and that past historical data didn't take into account BlackRock, didn't take into account Bank of America, Chase, Fidelity, didn't take into account probably a Bitcoin ETF in the next 16 months, didn't take into account the fact that I think the experiment in El Salvador is going better than I think people give it credit for. Interesting. And so there could be another nation that hops in. Um, mm -hmm. I'm mm -hmm. not really sure. I think if I put money, I put it goes to 25, but I do think that Bitcoin will go down again. And as it goes down, people who have, you know, FOMO'd into this may sell, but we'll see. I'm, uh, wh what are your thoughts? Uh, I think pro just statistical probabilities. This is not based on news. This is based on probabilities and momentum. I believe we will touch 25 before we hit 15 or 12, but hear me on this. I, I still believe we will do both. I still believe we will me hit too. 15. I me still too. believe we will hit 25. I believe we will temporarily hit something in the range. I'm going to say within 15 to 20 percent. No, within 10 percent of 25. No, we're already there. We're already within 10 percent. We're, we're already there. It's right there. Yeah, I think we will brush that before we hit 15, but I do think we'll hit 15. Now, Billy. If you're still watching out there, over what time frame? Bro, I have no idea. If you're sitting on 5K in USDC and you're waiting for it to hit 12, man, I believe you are playing a fish in a barrel game. I'm not fish in a barrel. I think you're, you're playing a probabilities game that's working against you. Personally, just my own, me taking what I do. If I had 5K, I would drop 25K, like if this was new money, and I know in Billy's case, this isn't. Billy is a very well-to-do investor and, and this is just play money for him, okay? Um, but to the average Joe who might've shown up with a grand or five grand, who's, in, who's living paycheck to paycheck, earning 100K a year, <laughs> you show up- 250, but earning, you know. Yeah, 250, but like, yeah, yeah, living on EBT. I get it. I mean, it's tough out there. So if you showed up with 1,000, 5,000, my technique, and Jared's technique is different, but my technique in the spirit of transparency 50% of it goes down immediately, no matter where it's at in the market, because I'm not making, I'm not trying to call it. I'm trying to get in because time in market to me is easier than timing the market. So I put 50% in right away. And then I start to dollar cost average and I'll put like a solid hundred bucks a month or every two weeks in to try to catch the movement. Once I understand the movement, I'll augment the amounts. And then once I start dipping below my dollar cost average at that point, I'll start increasing the amounts from 100 to 110 to 120 to 150 as I start going down to the point where I am doubling down. And now I have a decent dollar cost average that's near my number. That's how I approach it. Jarrett, for the sake of transparency, how do you approach currently your investing? Yeah, so I actually started uh, um, weekly DCA into Bitcoin starting did this start. past Monday. Yep. And I'll tell you, I'll probably actually share that hard number if you join us on Friday for Friday finances, but cool. that's weekly. And Monday, at least historically, has been the time Bitcoin has always been the lowest. And I saw that, I think BitBoy Crypto talked about that. And there's another guy who talked about that. And it's like, you know, there's some historic data there. So I, I like Mondays. And I'm still holding some on the sideline, though, getting ready for that 15 moment. But I have started to totally DCA just into Bitcoin weekly. Interesting. Which is exciting. Uh, but I am going to hold some on the side. I, yeah, I don't think it's a bad thing to hold cash in a down market. Like that's, that's sound, you know, sound uh, financial advice if you're going to take it, even though that's not, that's not financial advice. I guess we have to say that. At some point, it's just going to be like whatever. You should just but, wear it on the shirt. Yeah, we should just have like, I should have like a tattoo that just says, you know, not financial advice. <laughs> um, but I think you're totally right. I think it will hit 25. And then I think we'll go down. I'm not sure who said this. I'm not even sure it was Jay, but it says the Fed is meeting today, 25K or 15K depends Jay. on that. So I think the Fed will probably meet today and they'll decide that they only want 0.25 or 0.5 basis points, whatever. It's not going to be 0.75 basis points, or they're yeah. going to be saying that they're, they're seeing inflation kind of come down. Yeah. I actually don't think that that's true on Main Street if you look at freaking prices. Um, but 
neither here nor there. I think that they'll say it will go down. I think it will crack 25, but I do think before taxes, as I've always said, before taxes, people have to sell. I think before April 15th in the United States, between March and April 15th, I think that's when you're going to see the bottom. I've said it was going to be somewhere between January 1st and like the end of June. And so that's kind of like a, a place where I think you'd see the 15. But if it is good, if it does hit 15, it may yo-yo back up to 20 within a week. Yeah. Um, as people buy in with their, you know, their, 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 uh, their, their buys already put in. So I think it's really tough to say. I think if you see a quarter percentage, you're going to see a healthy bump, but I still think it will only be a bump. If you see a half a percent, I think you're going to see it dump. It's going to be a leveraged. Exactly. Exactly. That's, yeah. that's if you, if you're, that's if you're looking at this, for. I think you are spot on. If it's a quarter that they're going to increase, then you're going to see a pump definitely crack 25. If it only hits a half percentage point, then it's going to dump probably to 19 in the next two weeks, yeah. um, if not quicker, and then hover back around 18, 19, where I think maybe it probably should be. I do think in the third and fourth quarter of this year, you're going to see it get up. And, and by the end of the year, it will probably finish somewhere around 25, 30 comfortably. Mm -hmm. That's where like mm -hmm. the new will be. But right now, if you look at the trend line, you know, anywhere between 18 to 20 is probably where the market's going to go. So um, I want to share a quick anecdote, if I may. In yeah, the spirit please. of the NFTs we were talking about and crypto entering the mainstream, we have an intern in one of our companies and she started with us very, uh, I say intern, she, I think she's sub 20. I don't think she's 19, maybe 20. And um, uh, I won't give her whole story away for privacy of her own, but some of the sociological factors are important as we talk about crypto and as we talk about economics. I do believe she lives at home. She is in a a sophomore or junior out of college, and she is in the communications department. So she's very interested in comms. She came to us for a variety of reasons, but she has ended up doing a comparison and contrast to our existing brand. And I tasked her with reviewing the Doodles brand. And she's doing a comparison and contrast between, and this is in the spirit of building in the open. I've already said, we're trying to rebrand a lot of what we're doing. I've talked about in the earlier part of the episode that we're looking at licensing a Doodle, if not creating our own NFT, just for branding purposes sure and then letting people own a part of that brand right out of the gate and it, and knowing that it's about branding around our company so she did a comparison and contrast <clears throat> and we did her review today how did this homework go she said i had chat gpt up sidebar she did not have google up she said i had chat gpt up and i started having to learn she said i'd never heard of an nft she said i dove into the company and I realized, wow, these NFTs are interesting. And I said, why were they interesting? And if you've watched the show for two minutes ever, we all who watch this show know why this is interesting. And she said, I thought this was just like, I don't know, World of Warcraft or Dungeons and Dragons. Basically, it falls into the category of some frumpy male who's living at home with his mother and is not doing anything but trading these goofy uh, trading cards. And she said, I was shocked to realize there was something other than just the art. There was more to it than just the art. And, um, and Jay says ChatGPT is the new search engine. And yes, in fact, Jay, I think you and the three of us were on a show and we said this will be true. And Google just announced that um, they see them phasing Google search out in less than two years because of ChatGPT and technologies like them. That came out recently as mega. Wow. Can you imagine so this, that though? Big time. So this gal says, hey, I just realized what NFTs are. This could be really good for things like, I don't know what you call it, like provenance of artwork. I said, yeah, we're calling it attribution. And Web3, we call it the technology at large is attribution. Um, and, and here's the problems you have with even like buying an Andy Warhol painting. And you, even if you have the papers, now you have to prove that those papers are legit. We talked about all that. She said this. She said, I realized Pharrell was hired into the company. I asked my cohort at school if they had ever heard of doodles. No. I asked them if they had ever heard of NFTs and some of them were like, yeah, that's that goofy stuff. I then said, yeah, Pharrell is, the cre is one of the creative advisors and creative directors. They all said, oh, we heard about that. NFTs are entering through the back door of mm -hmm. mainstream media mm -hmm. and, and it's happening. And, and we're the old heads, right? They're calling us boomers, but they have no idea about some of this cutting edge tech. So when we say we're early, and I've pushed back, we might still be early, but it is trickling in the back door to some of these companies. And now she has onboarded conceptually 
a bunch of her peers through this goofy project of looking at this. So I'm getting excited about NFTs and their what, how they're, oh, she said this, and this was the big thing. She said, I think mm -hmm. a brand that's looking at something like chat or like doodles, I think what non, non web three, she didn't have that language. She said brands that are normal businesses, they need to learn from companies like doodles about building community. And I said, that is intuitive. That's catch that. Go ahead. Yeah. If you look at this job title, I'm about to say it yeah. only started to exist in 2021. Do you know the job title? And you just led into it. It's a very like community manager, community manager. What yeah. the hell? You know yeah. what that used to be? That used to be PR. That used to be marketing. Yes. That used to yes. be branding. Yeah. That used to be events. It used to be all of these things because yeah. years ago, not even years ago, I was looking at a community manager position for all South America for Algorand. Yeah. And yeah, I, I remember this. Final, I got to the final. And then this was in May or June of 2022. And I thought I was made in the shade. It was out of Bogota. It's going to be a good fit. Everything was going well. And then the market took a dump. And between yeah. basically May and June, I was a finalist for uh, Algorand and also uh, Polygon to do community mm. manager-ish things, but really build from the ground up. I was given yeah. a budget and just said, go out into these huge cities, make noise. Yes. And these things, like this idea of, of seeing, your, seeing your customers as community, this is a whole new idea. And this is where I think people are really, it's not like a whole new idea, but I mean, the idea of treating them, like giving them a community manager, like having a space that's 24 hours a day where they can talk to other customers. Yeah. AKA Discord, show me yeah. where that exists 10 years ago. It doesn't. 10 you know? years ago. We did it. We started it six years ago. And, it, and she laughed when I showed her this. To your point, there's web okay. two vestiges of this. And by vestiges, I mean, they didn't do it well. And sure. it's archaic. But those who did it are bringing us into the web three world. We have a Facebook group for all of our Spark sites owners. And they can talk to one another. They can ask each other troubleshooting questions about marketing or their website. We, post, we posted for the longest time courses into that Facebook group every month for years. And mm -hmm. we didn't realize it, but we were scratching at it. They've got to feel like they're a part of the family. But Web3 came along and codified this in such a more dynamic and value-driven way that we didn't even have language for it back then. We just thought we were doing the edgiest thing ever. Go ahead. Yeah. And I've been a part of groups for years that, you know, if you buy a course from someone, they'll say, oh, you get into our Facebook groups, you can talk to other people. And George just says, and I want to read his, his comment out here. It says, I come from the music industry. Community building and management has been happening for decades. Okay. It's the artist's fan base. Yeah. It used to be newsletters and mailings. Now it's yeah. Discord. The thing with news, newsletters and mailings is you're talking to someone. You're talking at someone, not to someone. And mm -hmm. You know, 20 or 30, even 10 years ago, there weren't, like, as far as I know, an email list for all Metallica fans where all Metallica fans could be heard. It was like, Metallica's doing this, and thanks so much. We thank you. It wasn't like, we thank you. And also, what are you saying right now in real time so we can, like, optimize in real time and move? This is where I think Web3 and NFTs and, and crypto and DeFi gets really difficult for people to wrap their head around because they actually have to be flexible in real time. And everyone talks about being agile and flexible and innovative but like when the rubber hits the road you're going to find out who well and so and, and this is where you know when you're in these things and they're so shiny and so clean like discord was for a while right and that technology is so clear and mm -hmm. the community building especially as it as it, it you know bleeds into twitter in different places it makes so much sense that this has never existed before but to george's point like well there was hints that this is what people wanted and, and to your point, like, do you remember GeoCities? This is what bulletin boards and fan boards were. Sure. And this is sure. what MySpace fan pages, they were the fans trying to connect with the fan base. And so the craving, well, I'll put it this way, the demand for this level of community building has actually been screaming into the void for some time, but all we had was newsletters, mailings. All we had was the VMAs or uh, an MTV unplugged. We're trying to give the fans what they need through this thing called the TV box, the, the idiot box. But now we've got things like Discord, which it's already chaos on fire. We need an even better upgrade. But George is right. The demand and the craving 
for these, I think, have been evidenced for many decades. Uh, that's why we have religions <laughs> in a lot of ways, you know. Um, but I'm grateful now, and in and, uh, and thinking back about my interim, I'm grateful that for all the successes and failures in such a short period of time that crypto and Web3 has built in the open, things like roadmaps, they will find their ways into non-crypto companies, roadmaps, where we're headed, oh, yeah. where we're headed as a landscaping company, where we're headed as a website company. And then I think um, community building will be the new mantra of modern, uh, uh, of uh, new media marketing, not even like social media marketing, not even like digital media, I mean new media, and that's the amorphous blank canvas of augmented reality. I showed her Decentraland, she goes, this is, doesn't have a use, does it? I was like, well, Snoop Dogg does concerts here. She was like, what? The eyes are opening that there are worlds within worlds. And this new media of like, the only thing that glues us together is every, like every, zero in one that connects us as a community. You know, even the show, Jay jumped on the show. He's over here making millions for a company and he's involved in the show today because there's some tangible and intangible belonging that I think yeah. happens of where are we going? Not, not the crypto bros, not the not crypto bros, but like everyone in the chat, where are they going? And how can I be in their life and build a relationship with them? Yeah. Anyways, I think, I think that this has gone a good way. What were we going to say? No, I was going to say that I, I, I just think communities have been around on the internet forever. And this is just now there's a different way for people to kind of rally around that value and exchange in certain spaces in real time. And, yeah. and it's just, it's just different. It's just different. Yeah. And everyone can see it and, and it's exciting. Um, before we do shout outs, I want to just take a super quick second to say that Grant and I, in our personal journeys for financial freedom and also just trying to like figure out the money game have started a sideshow, which is, ooh, Steve-O Crypto says this channel is a gem slash he wrote gym. I'm hoping it's a gem. <laughs> uh, Unless he's cool. sharing his favorite workout program where he trades crypto while curling for girls. Exactly. Curls for he's, girls. He's on, he's on the treadmill and every time he hits a mile, he buys Bitcoin. Um, yeah. So Grant, Grant and I have started up a little side project. It's gonna be on Fridays. It's in the morning. It's at 7 a.m. Eastern, which is kind of early if you're on the West Coast in the United States. We will put all the videos and they're going to be up on YouTube, but we talk about finances in a little bit more depth. Um, Grant and I often talk, talk, you know, talk about investments here on Not Crypto Bros, but Not Crypto Bros is really about investments and it's also and about community. the culture, yeah. community and the culture of Web3. Yeah, we want but to we have a new that. show called Friday Finances TV and I just wanted to give, us, give a shout out to that before, uh, before we kind of transition here and invite people. So if you want more information, you can find it um, on either of our LinkedIn's or, you know, you can DM us or just go to a YouTube and find our YouTube profiles. Um, yeah. His grants is Grant Sparks. Mine's Jared Carpenter. It's all there. Um, and we will be Friday is our second episode. So I just wanted to invite people to that. That's where we're really going to dive in more to the investment, the, the, the money management, the financial literacy of the, the lives that we're both living and how we're doing it and how we're trying to, you know, stay relevant in a world of, extreme inflation right and i want to contextualize this a little bit too um this show is sacred to us for crypto because crypto has a special place in all three of our lives jay myself jared you know we all have very fun unique journeys that we're proud of but we wanted to also touch on real estate and jerry jay once talked about flipping lambos and we want to make sure that though a lot is about crypto at our heart, crypto for me and Jared and Jay too, there's also freedom that we're looking for and financial freedom. And so we wanted to make sure that we kept this sacred for what it is and then that's sacred for what it is and, the, and bringing the transparency that I never got as a young investor. I started investing at 21. I found crypto when I was 31 um, and we've just been investing in everything since and I just want radical transparency. So we're trying to bring that there. But just keep in mind that crypto will be absolutely sacred here at Not Crypto Bros. Give us some quick shout outs. What do you got? Uh, my shout out is to everyone here in the comments. I thought we went in a thousand different places today. We talked about the metaverse. We talked about AI. We <laughs> talked about branding. We talked about crypto. We talked about crypto prices. We talked about TradFi. Shout out to everyone who's stuck with us, added amazing value because, you know, we're kind of like performers here and we really do feed off of the energy of the comments. Yeah, and good vibes. Also, 
my big shout out is to Jay. Uh, he says, great show, boys. So my, my big shout out is to Jay, who's still, I don't know, he's probably in the cubicle or somewhere over in the office, or maybe he's at home, but he's just like chatting away, listening to us. So shout out to Jay Harris. Jay, we'll see you next week. Um, Grant, what are your shout outs? Uh, I was going to shout out Jay as well for for uh, being here in spirit while he's helping make a great brand out there, great money. Shout out to Steve-O Crypto and our YouTube viewers. We we love our YouTube viewers big time. Shout out to George. George is a wealth of information. And George, I want to know you more personally and hear more about your journey. You sound like you have a lot going on. I think we've even talked before, but I, I just, I really thank you for your involvement. Of course, George Pate's always got some zingers. Zent Cash, tell us more about that. But what am I getting at? What are we talking about? Community. I'm telling you, if I have to nerd out about NFTs and cryptos and even shit coins, to be around this awesome vibe of a community, I'll totally do that. I, like that That's like for life. So that's what I got today. Jared, where can people find us? <laughs> uh, find us on YouTube, Twitter, and LinkedIn at Not Crypto Bros. And we will see you back here at Tuesday at 3.30 p.m. Eastern next week. Thanks so much for showing up. Thanks, guys. Have a great day.